This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Good evening and welcome to the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science Speaker Series. My name is Cheryl Peach and I'm a program scientist here at the Birch Aquarium at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. It's my great pleasure this evening to welcome Dr. Cisco Werner, the Director of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Southwest Fisheries Science Center. The Southwest Fisheries Science Center uh, actually has as its, as its mission supporting the management and conservation of domestic and international living marine resources. So it does this in myriad ways, and you're going to hear a little bit about some of them tonight. His research efforts span the study of the structure and function of marine ecosystems, ocean circulation and ocean physics, and the development and implementation of ocean and coastal observing and forecasting systems. And that's going to be the topic of his talk this evening. So please join me in welcoming Cisco for his talk titled, The Critical Need for Sustained Ocean Observations, the California Cooperative Oceanic Fis Fisheries Investigations, also known as Cal Coffee, and beyond. Cisco, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Like Cheryl said, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about ocean observations. I'll give you an, a fisheries perspective um, in the end, but um, I, I, I'll talk about just the importance of observations in general and, and, and how important they are to, uh, to understanding our, our, our system, our Earth system, not just the oceans, but just more broadly. And um, you know, the, the cartoon here has, has the guy there next to the chart with a wiggly line, and, and he says, you know, why does it always have to represent something? Um, and, and there'll be some wiggly lines in, in, in the presentation, but ho hopefully in the end, you know, it, it, um, it, it will make sense in terms of them uh, representing something. Um, like, like, uh, like Cheryl said, um, I'm down at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. Uh, this is the building just, just down the hill from here. It is, it is a wonderful building, and I would just like to invite everybody to come see it. Um, it is, uh, it's truly remarkable, I, you, as, as Cheryl said. The mission of, of the center is, is to, um, uh, to, to do the science that's needed to conserve and manage, and manage our, our living marine resources. And um, about three years ago, we moved into this building. It's really a, a state-of-the-art facility. It's not just offices and, and pretty places. It actually has some pretty uh, fantastic laboratories, and I'll talk about some of them today so, so you can come visit. And just a little bit more about what we do. Um, we are spread all over uh, the, uh, the, the California. We're based, I guess, down in, in, in La Jolla, uh, but we have um, uh, field sites in Piedras Blancas, Granite Canyon, Monterey, Santa Cruz, and even all the way up to uh, uh, Humboldt State. Um, and our research uh, area it includes not just the California current system, but the Eastern Tropical Pacific, um, as well as down in the Antarctic. Uh, and so we, 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 we do these measurements all over the place. And um, I should just mention that very recently in the Antarctic, you may have heard about that, the new marine protected area that was established down here in the Ross Sea. And that was something that really emerged out of a lot of the work that, that we did in, in the center. And, and again, we're, we're glad to, if you could come and if you wished and, and talk to us about it and, and we could tell you what, what all went into developing a, a marine protected area. Um, and then I just finally, before I, I, ju I just jump into the, to the presentation, I wanted to let you know that, that uh, between the Northwest Fisheries Science Center based in Seattle and us here, we're, we're responsible to manage, for managing uh, over 120 uh, uh, species. Um, uh, some of them you know, are, are uh, species that, that, that we manage for harvesting and, and consumptions. Others are, others are, others are environmental, uh, I'm sorry, Endangered Species Act protected. Um, and so it runs anywhere from shellfish to turtles to sea lions to whales to salmon to, you know, to, to rockfish to sardines and, and so on. And, and we do this in, in, in full context of, of the environment. And so how we manage these species 
really depends on understanding what, what goes on in the environment. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these time series, and I'll talk a little bit about Cal Coffee, but, but also areas or, or, or topics that are related to, to that. And so the outline of my presentation is I'll, I'll actually start talking a little bit about historical records and the importance of understanding present day measurements with, 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 uh, with, with historical records. Then I'll talk about biological and fisheries time series and I'll touch upon uh, Cal Coffee and some regional efforts and how we use them in management. Then if we go into the time series, the archives themselves, uh, surprises that, that have emerged from looking at these, so the importance in keeping these, these, these time series or these, these long-term observing systems so that we can extract information from them, and then uh, some concluding remarks. And I figured I'd start with, with something that, that is quite familiar to, to, I'm sure, most of you here, um, two, two pictures that I'm sure are quite familiar to both of you. One is, of course, uh, the Keeling curve. Um, you know, it's a long-term effort. You know, you know, clearly led by Ralph Keeling, but it's a long-term collaboration with NOAA. So it's one of the many things that we do together. And also the uh, the, the Mona Lisa. And 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 what what time series do, you know, is is, is they're just or some of, some of them are quite iconic. And and I think that if you think of any time series as being iconic, it has to be the Keeling curve. And what it does is just like the Mona Lisa draws you into the museum and find out what, 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 is, what is art, what, what, is, what does it all mean? I think you see a time series like, like the Keeling Curve and, and it also draws you in and says, well, how does this relate to everything? You go to the Louvre and you, decide, you, know, you find out about Egyptian art or Assyrian art and how things build on it. Well, the same in some ways, you know, you could think about, about the observations. And so, you know, started by, by, by Ralph Keeling, it, you know, we, we, we have the observatory in, in Mauna Loa. I'm not sure if you had a chance to visit, but it, it's, it's open, it's, you can go visit it. You have to make an appointment, but you can go visit. And so you have that time series, and so we combine, if you combine this time series and say, well, okay, this tells us a lot about what the CO2 levels have been in the last 50 years or so. If you go to Antarctica, and, and, and there's this Vostok ice core, which is about two miles or so of, of ice, and you drill through it, you drill through the ice and then you, you pull out the, um, you know, the ice core and you pull out the ice core and then you, you lay it on the side <clears throat> and then you, be, because you lay it on the side, you know that the deeper part was obviously, you know, the oldest part and the, and the one near the surface is the nearest one. You can then construct from it a time series. And so if you, if you drill all the way down, it's about two and a half miles of ice, which, which also represents about a half million years of, of, of in, in, in time. And a couple of things emerge, you know, if you look at, at this half million years in time, you see that pretty much there's been these two set points in, 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 the, in the variation of, of CO2. It, it kind of goes back and forth, you know, from about 280 to 180, then back up to 280, then down to 180, then back up to 280, and so on. Until very recently, it's, it's still there. But if, but if you take this time series, which is a natural time series of, of CO2, and then you superimpose on that the Keeling curve, you, you immediately a lot of things jump out in terms of what, what's happened. And so, you know, it, it, it's, I'm, I'm trying to get at this, this whole idea that here we were, we saw this, and all of a sudden you, you're drawn into saying, well, what does this mean, you know, and how do we interpret what, what, what this comes out in, 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 a, in a bigger context? And, you know, what you see here is that in the last 50 years or so, we basically have, uh, you know, added as much CO2 to the atmosphere as that, uh, as, as the variations, you know, this, hun this 100 parts per million or so between these 180 and, and 280 set points over half a million years. So it's a pretty, pretty, um, you know, telling uh, uh, piece, of, piece of data. So what, what do these time series tell us? I mean, they, they give us a baseline, a backdrop to, to, to our understanding of what's going on. Sometimes we see cycles. Sometimes we see long-term or, or secular changes, sort of so, slow changes in, in what we see. And sometimes we see surprises. And, and at the same time, they also invite you to say, well, what is it that caused these things? You know, why, why is it that, we, why is it that that's, the signals are what, 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 what we see, or the early cartoon? Do they really represent something? And if you look at, at, the first, at this first half million years or so, the way that that is related, or what you, the way you can understand that, it has to do with, with what are called Milankovitch cycles. And so you can, it, they're related to, to variations in, 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 the, in the Earth's orbit and the precession and the tilting and so on and so forth. So what you would think are relatively small changes in, in orbital properties, if you will, you know, 
sort of amplifying in, in, in the Earth system and, and giving you these, 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 these pretty remarkable responses to, again, what you would think are relatively small changes in, in planetary um, uh, characteristics. This last bit over here, um, you know, the thing that's invites in terms of, uh, that is invited in terms of what is it that caused this, 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 the, 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 uh, the Keeling curve or what explains Keeling curve is, is you know, it's, it's, it's one way to relate it, of course, is, is through the, uh, to, to the increase in, in human population and, and um, um, you know, what, what, what we've brought to that. So I'll go through this real quick, so don't, please don't, don't, don't you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that, that we get through this. What, what, what it does is again, you got a half million of half million years of, of really this this relatively stable, although oscillatory system, and now we're in a system that that you know you see these little curves that they all kind of look like the Keeling curve, which really tells us that what we are is in a no analog state. You know, we're we're in we're in something that we perhaps haven't seen before. This is the CO2 that we've seen before, but it's other things as well. There's there's N2O concentrations, methane concentrations. Um, you know, you, look, you can look at, you know, properties of ocean ecosystems or you can look at the biogeochemistry, you can look at all kinds of things, all sorts of different properties of the Earth system, and, and they all have this pretty dramatic rate of change. So it's not just one or two things changing, but it's, it's, it's a whole host of things that are changing and the rate at which they're changing that, that makes things really challenging. So these are pretty uncertain times, I guess, in terms of understanding how all this comes together. And if you, again, look at it in terms of you know, relating it to a possible, a possible causal mechanism, you know, clearly the, the population growth, over, this is over the last 250 years, we know that, that the, popula the human population is growing, and then you can relate it to a whole host of things, you know, you know the effect of damming the rivers, the water usage that we know, um, and, and other metrics that, 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 that combine to give us something that, that we hadn't seen. And so <clears throat> the question that comes up, and, and you may have seen this before, is have we, ant have we entered what's called the Anthropocene? And this is a cover from The Economist. Um, and the question really is, um, you know, have we entered perhaps a new geologic era? Uh, and again, this is, this is a, the amazing part of this is the combination of, as I said, of, of this long-term natural record and, 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 and the Keeling curve in this case in terms of bringing these two together to say, have we found, have, are we entering a, a new era? And, and now that actually one of, the, one of the hardest things to do is to define where, where it is, say, in the stratigraphic record, in the sedimentary records that you would say, aha, uh -huh, you know, there, there, there it is, the, the, the effect of humans. And we, we all know that if you go to parks, and this is a cliff side over here, and, and you, know, you, you see all these different layers and so on, and every so often a, a particular layer is identified and what's called a golden spike is, is put there as identifying that layer that defines, say, for example, you know, when, when the asteroid hit the Earth and, and, and um, you know, caused the mass mortality of, of, of the dinosaurs. And we define that by the concentration of iridium or some chemical that we hadn't seen before. And so the question is now, you know, is there a, a layer that says, okay, this is where humans came in and now we're in a different era? And so you might see this in, 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 in the literature or in the newspapers in terms of what, what is it, what is it, uh, what is it, what defines the Anthropocene and when did it start? So I want to jump now to some place a little bit closer, still building on I, what I'd like to think is a community here that, that we have, uh, you know, still focusing on California, um, is, is, is the question of the drought, you know, and the question of the drought, uh, particularly in the last five years, um, in some ways, has been um, some of the worst uh, some of the worst drought uh, that we've seen in 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 in, in, in recent record, um, and and if you look at it more clearly, and these pictures are these are not composites; these are side by. This is one picture, and you can see a neighborhood here, and then you can see what this is, the, what the what the what the land would look like were it not watered and developed, and so on and so forth. So to to see this too, you clearly see that there's a, a large demand for water. This is another one that's pretty dramatic in terms of a neighborhood, really what's in a desert and, and you know, a, a house there in there. So we know that we're doing something, you know, that, that perhaps is not consistent with, with what, the, the na what the environment would, would suggest that, that we can do. And so you say, well, um, and now we're entering this drought, and, and is it really one of the worst droughts we've seen? And I want to go into another time series, in this case, um, the bristlecone pines. And the bristlecone pines are these pines that live several, you know, almost a couple thousand years or a thousand years or so. And by looking at their tree rings, uh, you can, again, develop this time series about, you know, what it is, what is it uh, that, you know, were there periods of 
wet versus dry, and they're distributed in California, Nevada, and, and, and state, states nearby. And so if you, if you go back and drill, so to speak, into the, into the tree rings, and here's a 2,000-year time series, uh, you see that um, you, you, you get variations between, between droughts and, and, and wet periods. And there's particular years or particular e eras, you know, of, of, of perhaps even a couple hundred years or so of what, what are called mega droughts. And overlaying on this, so now this isn't, this isn't 2,000 years, this is just, you know, the last, say, 1,200 years, so zooming in a little bit, you see that in the medieval times there were these long, long mega droughts. We're talking here almost 300 years, another couple hundred years of mega droughts. But you know, from about 1500 on, we were sort of in a in a um, in a wet period, in a in a in a in a, uh, in, a, in, a in a period that that perhaps you know was one that was conducive to to finding an environment you know where we could sustain the population that we that we live in and the agriculture and the and and, and the aquifers and so on. So again, you begin to look at, these, at, at this information in context in terms of uh, what is it that we can expect, uh, you know, can we, in terms of looking back in time. And for us from the fishery side, uh, this of course is important, you know, because we manage the salmon and the salmon of course depend on the water and, and such. And so for us to understand how we manage the salmon, we also again have to look backwards in time uh, to see what, you know, just how cautious we should be and, and the kinds of expectations we, we should have. So speaking of fish, I'll just jump quickly to, um, to, to a couple of examples here on sardines. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll again start with, with a recent record. And the recent record is maybe the last 20 years or so. And, and this is a, uh, a, 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 um, taken out of a, a newspaper article in 2015 that shows the sardine population fluctuations. Um, and you know, they're, they're, they, this is the landings, I guess, the catch that you have. And so it caught a lot, and it dropped, and it came up again, and it dropped again. And of course, you know, there's a concern about you know, what, what causes the, the decline in the sardines. If you go back a little bit more, say from instead of looking at 20 years, you look at the last 100 years or so, you see that you know, there used to be a period when there was a lot more, which of course, you know, when they uh, dropped and when they declined, uh, you know, it led to the to the Cannery Row, um, uh, uh, you know, John Steinbeck uh, uh, novel, and so on. So, if you begin to look back, you say, well, you know, have they come and gone, and what what is it that that has come and gone? What's what's that context? And 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 if you go back even further on the sardine and anchovy uh, question, um, you what we find is by going off, uh, you know, in, in the Santa Barbara Channel. Uh, what, what you have is, is an area where the bottom of the, of the channel is actually anoxic, meaning that there's very little oxygen in there. So if something falls in there, you know, the, the chances of it being preserved are, are pretty good. Uh, and that has to do because there's, again, oxygen poor water coming in, so say into the, into the Santa Barbara Channel. And so then what happens is that the, the sardine and anchovy, they actually uh, shed um, the, uh, the, the fish scales or their scales. And when they fall into the, into the sediment, uh, the, and, and then you, you take the sediment out with a sediment core, and, and just like tree rings or just like the ice core, you can date the various layers or varves, as they're called. Uh, you, can, you can date them, um, and, and then you can count the, 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 uh, the scales. If you count the scales per varve, then what a, a script scientist uh, down here, uh, John Isaacs, uh, found, was that you could go back a couple of thousand years. So this is now, this is today, and this is 2,000 years ago. And if you look at the sardine and anchovy fish scales count in, the, in, the, in these var of sediments, what you find is that they also fluctuated, and they also went up and down. So it again suggests that there is, at this time, there was natural variability that has to be taken into account in, in any kind of management action that we, within, within fisheries, would do. So this kind of invites the question of, okay, so um, what is it that drives some of these fluctuations in, in, in sardine and anchovy? And so this finally leads me to the point of, Cal of CalCoffee. CalCoffee, the California Cooperative um, Oceanic uh, Fisheries Investigations, is a, is a partnership between Scripps and NOAA and the California uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. And it was formed in 1949, so it's almost 70 years old. Um, and, and it used to run all the way from basically Northern California into the, into the Gulf of Mexico. And these stations were occupied um, 
you know, several times a year. And the idea was to understand what is it that caused, you know, the ups and downs of, of, of the sardine and anchovy population. Um, while, you know, the, the focus was on sardine and anchovy, it was also a very um, forward-looking um, uh, effort in, in that it, it also included a whole host of environmental uh, components that, that went in, in, in that, that accompanied the, the measurements that would be related to fisheries. So it wasn't just counting fish eggs or fish larvae, but it measured temperature, oxygen, and a whole bunch of other things. And so this has resulted in a, uh, in an extremely valuable, it's probably, um, first of all, it's the second longest uh, time series of, of this nature that there is. The other one I'll talk about at the end is the, is the, is the uh, continuous plankton recorder. It's a little bit longer, but it's not as comprehensive as Cal Coffee. And it's really something that has anchored, in many ways, uh, our understanding of, of, of the variability of the ocean and the relationship of that variability to the, to the variation in, in fish populations. And so in this case here, you, know, you can see that this is changes in oxygen, which we talked a little bit about before. Uh, these, this has to do with changes in temperature, and of course, you know, we, we do have these variations in, in the fish populations as well. The goals are to understand the long-term changes of the California current um, ecosystem. And, it's, and while it looks at, at, at the physical, biological, and chemical characteristics that are local to, to Southern California, if you will, it is also linked to the basin scale, what happens in the broader Pacific. And, and because it provides that that continuous time series and that continuous information, a whole other number of, of programs have tried to piggyback on it and, and how do you relate to it. I mean, it's, it's basically the idea going back to the, to the Mona Lisa and a time series. All of a sudden, other people want to say, well, how do I relate what I observe to what Cal Coffee brings to the table and so on. And so you wind up um, you know, looking at measurements of ocean acidification or variations in, in, um, in species and, and so on. And so for example, I'll just talk about two examples here on, on what Cal Coffee has brought. Um, you know, it, 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 it has brought uh, you know, a better understanding of the fluctuations in, in fish biomass, so how many fish there are there. Um, and, and for example, it showed a long-term decline in, in, in Boccaccio larvae. These are, these are rockfish that are down there. Um, or, you know, cow cod, which is another one that, that is of, of interest in terms of conserving the cow cod, and, and, and it's a very, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a desirable fishery, but, but you know, it, it, it has shown the, the decline on it. Or getting back to the sardine, because of the relationship between the measurements of the fish and the, and the environment, um, it, it, it has um, uh, allowed us to, to understand you know, why the, the, the sardine do better at certain times than other, or why the anchovy do better at certain times than other. So it really is, the importance here is to, is to, is to, is to integrate all of these measurements. And in the basement of our building that I talked about, we have the archive of the Cal Coffee uh, data. Uh, we have the 70 years, if not longer, because some, there were some measurements before that. And so we have the larval fish and specimen archive down there. And it's like, a, you know, those, those um, uh, uh, you know, those, those uh, libraries where you have the dense packing of the bookshelves and, and so on. And so we have all of these things are filled with, with, with these little vials. And these little vials have these little larvae in here. And these little larvae, you know, in this case, this is a little anchovy larvae or something. And these are available to the public uh, in the sense of, you know, if you're doing research and you want access to them, a graduate student or something, you're welcome to, to, look, at, look, to look at it. But it also all of a sudden this archive can be explored in different ways. It's not just a matter of counting how many there are, um, but actually with the advent of, of new uh, uh, genetic and genomic uh, techniques, we can actually look at, 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 at what was in the archive in, in ways that we hadn't thought about. And so I just want to bring a real quick example of, of, of one case study of of bridging that or using some of that archive um, to, um, to estimate or to, to see if, if some of the um, protected areas, the marine protected areas, the MPAs, uh, are actually working. And, and as you know, so here, here we are in Southern California, and these yellow dots are part of the Cal Coffee time series, and this little square that's maybe hard to see is one of the closed areas, and there's another little closed area over there. And the question has to do is, well, are they working? I mean, we've closed the fishery here for a number of years. Uh, you know, do we see any evidence of, of, of them coming back? 
And this is work led by some folks in our lab um, in terms of um, how is it that, that we can go about determining how many there are. And so this area over here along the, the west coast of North America, so you see the red color is here, and then it goes to a purple color here and another purple color here. The red indicates the, the highest concentration of, in this case, rockfish. And so we happen to be in an area, which is, which is the red area, which has the highest concentration of rockfish. And as you go further north, perhaps it gets a little bit too cold and you have much fewer rockfish. And if you go further south, it might get a little bit too warm and you get fewer rockfish because, you know, for, for, for the other reason. Because we are in this area where uh, the overlap of the Kalkafi and the, protect and the uh, conservation areas are in this high diversity, is what I should say, uh, population, and the, it becomes kind of tricky to actually identify and tell, tell little larvae apart. And so the only way we can do it is actually, you know, through, through genetic methods. And so what we've done is that we've gone through those little vials, and genetically we've been able to identify the differences between those 50 or so uh, different, uh, different uh, rockfish that, that are down there. And so we, we do the collection, we, we sort them, and then we, there's, you can only ID them to a point, but then if you actually want to genetically ID them, then you actually have to, to actually get into their, into their genome, ge, you know, the, the genetic information. And so we were able to do this, and the question was, well, are the conservation areas working? I mean, is, is this something that, that, is, that is actually um, helping the, the populations recover? And so of the 39 species that we identified, we split them between eight that are not targeted, so they're not fished, and seven that are fished. And so you say, okay, well, how did the conservation area help those that were not fished recover? And, and, and if you just think about it, you would say if you were a targeted fish, over time, if you're not fished, you should recover. I mean, you should you'd think that you're gonna get more of them because, because, because you're not fishing them anymore and you're being protected. Roughly, if you're not targeted, then over time you should remain constant because, you know, your population hasn't been affected by extraction. Um, there are some assumptions in there, but that, that's roughly what, 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 you would, what you would expect. But it's not that simple because they also depend on not just whether they're fished or not, but are the environmental conditions the right ones. And so if you look over time, over at, at, this is why the wiggly lines actually matter. If you look over time, we find that since the conservation areas have been closed, the conditions, this indicated by this blue, are actually pretty good because they like low temperatures. They live in, you know, near the bottom of, 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 the, sh of the continental shelf, so they like the low temperatures, and, and it's been cold for the past, um, or during, during the, you know, over the past, whatever, 15 years or so. I'll talk about the warm blob in, in a second in a different context. They like oceanic water, which is more saline. They like chlorophyll, and they like oxygen. So you have two things going on. You stop fishing, but you also have the right environmental condition. And so then that becomes a little tricky because how, do you, how can you tell apart whether it was the environment that caused them to recover or whether it was the fact that you stopped fishing that caused them to recover. And so you, you do expect some recovery of untargeted species the, the, the recovery of the untargeted species in the conservation area and outside the conservation area to show a positive trend because the environment was good. But you would expect the targeted species to perhaps do better in the conservation area than outside because over here you've removed the environmental component or you've corrected for the environmental component um, uh, uh, in addition to the not being fished component. And really, to make a long story short, is that it appears that the conservation areas are, are working. If you, if you correct for the environment, these targeted species, in both cases here, those that are in the conservation area are actually increasing. The blue is outside the conservation area, and they're, they're flat. So they, they didn't, correcting for environment, they didn't, they didn't recover. Whereas those that are not targeted, remain flat both inside and outside the conservation area. So the point here is that, is that you know, when we establish these conservation areas, you know, we, we know that there's a number of factors that have to go in in terms of seeing if, if this works or not. And through this long time series and, and the whole host of, 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 of variables that we collected, we're able to actually 
make a management decision or, or at least assess you know, the, the management decisions that were made 10, 15 years ago and see if they're actually working. So this is suggestive that, that it looks like we might be, we might be doing, uh, that the conservation areas might actually be working. All right, well, as I said, context, right? It's all context. And so let me take a little step back and say, okay, the, the Cal Coffee program is over here, uh, but you know, we're all part of a bigger thing called the California Current Large Marine Ecosystem, the California Current Ecosystem. And that goes roughly from Vancouver Island down to the tip of Baja. And in addition to the Cal Coffee time series, we have several others, we have one off Humboldt or Eureka, we have one, you know, in in, uh, in Oregon. We, you know, we have we have them all over the place. And and the importance of, of these is 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 trying to understand the California current ecosystem in a, in a, in a in a bigger way. And and the reason is um, because the California current large marine ecosystem is is really um, you know unique in many ways. And and you may have seen that that it's sometimes referred to as a, as a Serengeti, a blue Serengeti. Uh, and that's because this, this region is so highly productive um, and, 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 and if you actually tag, uh, you know, you put, you put um, you know, um, uh, satellite tags on, on a whole host of organisms, it can be tuna, it can be seals, it can be sharks, it can be birds, it can be turtles, uh, you know, what you, what you observe is that, you know, they come from all over the Pacific, you know, to the area over here in the California current to feed. Um, you know, many of them, like bluefin tuna, uh, which you probably have heard in, you know, was in the news in the last two, two three years, they, they spawn off Japan, but they come to the California current to feed, as do the leatherback turtles, as do many of the birds and so on. So it's a really special place in terms of, in terms of what goes on there. And so what is it that, that drives, you know, that, that blue Serengeti or that, that, that richness? And, it comes down to, if you start going drilling down into lower into the food web, it's these little animals called copepods. Uh, they're roughly grain, uh, rice grain size, and, and, and there's different kind of copepods, depending on whether they come from the north or if they're more from the south. So those copepods that come from the north are much higher in lipid content. Uh, they're more like cheeseburgers, as it says over here. And those that come from the south are much lower in lipid content. It's more like eating celery. And so what you really have is a difference, a fundamental difference at the, at the base of the food chain in terms of how much energy goes into the food web, depending on whether you have these copepods, which are rich in lipid contents, versus this kind of copepod, which is much lower in lipid content. And, and not, that's not the only part, but there's a whole biodiversity side of, 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 what, of, what, of the copepod uh, productivity that you see. But further north, off Newport, Oregon, uh, there's been a, a very long time series, not as rich and complex, but, but, but very important, uh, that's run by the Northwest Science Center, uh, colleague uh, Bill Peterson, that he's been looking at, at, at the copepod uh, population and the relative population um, over time here, so this is 1994 roughly until now, uh, and, and he's been able to relate it to variations in um, uh, temperature and other large scale uh, uh, conditions that are one, one thing is called a PDO, which is a Pacific Decadal Oscillation and so on, but, but what you see is the following. So when, when it's cold and it's blue, you actually see the northern copepods also being positive. So these are the lipid-rich ones. When it's warm, it actually you see then the lipid-poor uh, copepods. And you do the same thing here, it recurs again, and over time here, it was a, a, a period where it was cold, the ocean conditions were cold, um, and, and you had again the, the concentration or, or a higher abundance of the lipid-rich ones which again, it was related to, that, to, the, to the conditions I talked about earlier with the cow cod and, and the other um, uh, uh, rockfish, uh, uh, you know, being at the right time in terms of a conservation area being there, that environmentally they were also helped. And what, what emerges then is that us understanding what it is that, you know, the, co the, the copepod population is will actually can be used to 
to understand how it is that higher trophic levels, sardine, anchovy, um, you know, salmon, and others are likely to 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 fare in terms of them finding the right um, feeding environment or the right ocean conditions. Hake and salmon both basically do the same thing, meaning they come to the southern part of, of, of the North American, con well, of, 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 nor of the US, US Mexico border to spawn. So they have their spawning areas here, but they all go north and they all wind up somewhere off Washington, Oregon to feed. And it's because there is that um, lipid rich or, or, or you know, uh, energy rich uh, feeding environment that you have up there. And it's not necessarily that they eat the copepods, and again, here's sort of the lipid globules, but they eat the bigger things that depend on having these energy-rich uh, copepods present. And so what's developed in a, very, um, in a very simplistic way is you can develop a spotlight chart, and these are years. It goes from 98 to 2016. And, and you can measure these different conditions. Again, you have these, these series, and you can say, well, red is not good, yellow is halfway in between, and, and green is good. And what you find is the same figure I showed before, in this case for salmon, is that, is that, that, that Pacific Decadal Oscillation, again, when it's, when, it's, when it's red, meaning it's not good for salmon, it's a whole host of things that, that, are, not, that are not working. Um, and and when, it's, when it's in, this, in, in, in the black color, it's, 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 it's actually good. And, and, and the feeding environment for the salmon and the sardine and the anchovy and all that will be, will be, will be, uh, will be better. And so what this does, again, is how do we use these, obs these observations uh, to anticipate what may happen or to look backwards and try to understand what happens? So it's, it's, it's really the integration of all of this that, that allows us to, um, to, to really understand um, how our system works. And, and I'll just show here something. This is, um, I don't know if you, you know, for those of you who receive the National Geographic or if on, your, on your way to the airplane, airport or somewhere, and you, can, and you can buy it. The September issue of 2016, so just, what, two months ago, um, had a very, very nice article about the warm blob. And you may have seen the warm blob in the news. It was basically three years' worth of unusually warm conditions in the North Pacific. It wasn't just temperature. There were harmful algal blooms up and down the west coast. Alaska is here. It comes down. Here's Vancouver Island. Here's the west coast of the United States, and Baja California is here. And, and, and what it did was that it, 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 it really shocked the system. It was almost like a, if you want to call it a climate change stress test, you know, just like when, when, the, we, you know, when there's stress tests in financial systems and you say, well, what happens if unemployment goes up by so much or interest rates change so much? You know, what happens to the financial systems? What we saw over here was a similar stress test, but, but to our ecosystems. And we saw in some places, you know, great conditions for feeding of whales and humpbacks. We, but, it, but on the other hand, we saw some places where sea lions were in trouble. We saw a whole host of these red crabs, and they were all over our beaches over here. Uh, there were mortalities, not just of mammals, but also whales up in Alaska. And so on, and it's uh, it, it 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 again understanding the context of of what happened here, and having something like Cal Coffee or having something like the the Newport line, and so on, is something that really um, allowed us to um, to understand what happens, and, and and perhaps stress the continued importance of measuring measuring what's out there. I want to jump for the last couple of slides in, into a bigger context, and, and I'm I'm going to jump to a couple of examples in the Atlantic. And, and this has to do with what are called the CPR surveys. And the CPR surveys is a continuous plankton recorder, and I'll tell you what it is. There's, there's the thing there. But these are, these are all these areas over here. There's this time series here since 1931. In the North Pacific, it started in 2000. There's some between um, uh, Australia and, and the Antarctic continent. And what it does is measures different kinds of plankton, both phytoplankton and zooplankton. And, and what it is is, um, it is taking ships of opportunity, so like cruise ships that, that you would go on on a vacation, and they throw this, this thing over. Here's uh, Sir Alistair Hardy who, who, who invented it uh, or, or developed it, um, and, and they drag it behind the, the, the cruise ship, and it goes at about 20 knots, so it's very robust and all of that. And inside this gadget, there's a, a long, it's like a set of rollers, and there's gauze, and the gauze is turning, and it just kind of, every so often just, just 
turns and, and whatever happens to be in the water there is captured, it's captured in the gauze and then you, you analyze it and, and you look and see what's there. And so this is the part I want to talk to you about surprises in, in time series and things that we, that, we, that, we don't, that we didn't expect to see. And one of the things in that Atlantic uh, part of the, of the continuous plankton recorder is, is the occurrence of this phytoplankton um, that although it has been known to exist in the Atlantic, it has not been seen in the Atlantic for over 800,000 years. So it's even longer than that ice core. And so all of a sudden, you, you, after, after 800,000 years, they, they saw something that was from the Pacific. It used to be in the Atlantic, but, but now, no longer the Atlantic. It was relatively common in the Pacific. All of a sudden, they now found it in, in, in the Atlantic. And they found it um, in this region here of the Labrador Sea. So there's Greenland, Greenland up here, and here's uh, Newfoundland, and, and you know, Cape Cod is done over here, and there's Iceland. And in this area, it, 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 they, they were able to find it in this continuous plankton recorder. And, and the idea is that it probably had to do, or one explanation, it had to do with the decrease in the sea ice. And so this is the part about the time series that say, okay, well, I saw something, how do I explain it? You know, we talked earlier about whether it was the orbits of the planets in the case of, of, of the Vostok ice core, but in this case, you begin to see, well, what, what could explain something that, that was occurred only in the Pacific, you know, making its way in, into the Atlantic? And, and one mechanism that has been proposed has to do with the, um, with the change in the sea ice. And more recently, it's actually now been found not just in this area of the Labrador Sea, uh, but in this part over here between, between Greenland and, and say, uh, Norway. And so it suggests that the changes that we're seeing in, 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 in the Arctic uh, and the ice content or the, the, the amount of ice that's there is leading to different circulation and exchanges between, between the two. And that, of course, you know, will have, you know, it, it could have interesting implications in terms of the, of the diversity of organisms that's there. And um, my last slide, my second to last slide, has to do with also the CPR. And this is a recent paper, 2016, um, uh, the Continuous Plankton Recorder. They went back into the archive, just like we have the archive in those little vials um, in, in the building down there. There's an archive of those gauzes and, and what's there. And so they went back. And what they did was, remember the CPR here is Europe, and here's North America. And so this goes back and forth. And they picked certain sites, and they looked at at, at, at um, the presence of, of Vibrio. And Vibrio is, is that bacterium that, that actually causes cholera. And so what they did was look back, and, and, and this is temperature. And so the idea here was to relate the presence of Vibrio to change to places where the temperature has increased. And what they found when they looked at, say, northern Europe and the US Atlantic coast is that there was a relationship between the presence of these Vibrio bacteria or, or organisms uh, that cause, that are the pathogen that could cause cholera that, that are related to an increase in, in, in perhaps those, those diseases that have been reported. And so, you know, Vibrio, or I'm sorry, cholera is, is waterborne and is transmitted that way. And the point here is, is that, um, you know, by looking into these archives of, of these records that we have, whether it's Calcafi or whether it's CPR, there's a whole host of other things that we can begin to look at and try to understand how, how things have changed. And this really is, is my last slide, is, is, is just perhaps the obvious call for, for more information in terms of, of, of how it is that we, we need to increase certainty in, in what we see in times of perhaps increasing uncertainty. I mean, we really are th seeing changes that are very rapid. We're, we're seeing changes that are pretty significant. Um, and and we, this is a time perhaps when, when we do have the capability, you know, and, uh, to, 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 with better ships with more instruments in the water, with bringing in new molecular techniques and so on uh, to measure things in situ uh, in the water itself to get a, a better understanding of how it is that uh, the ocean is changing, how the Earth system is changing, and how it's all coupled. And in the end, it's hopefully to manage the system better, going back to our mission as the Southwest Center, is to manage our system better, both you know, in terms of, of the living marine resources and, and how to better conserve them. And so with that, I, I'm first again, thank you again for, for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, I'd be pleased to take them on. Thank you. The question is the, the, the CPR, why do the folks at CPR not do the, the, the collection of fish larvae? And it has to do with, with the actual towing of the, um, of the instrument. It makes it very hard 
for, for, for them to capture that in the gauze. And, and it's just, you know, the, the ships are going at 20 knots. And normally when we're collecting larvae, you know, you're, you're, you're not moving. You're actually taking a water sample and carefully, um, you know, conserving it and so on. So it's, it's a methodological issue. And so on the other hand, the smaller plankton and so on, they can get caught up in the, in the gauze and, and preserved um, without any damage to them. So it's, yep. It's been, what, I believe a little over five years since Fukushima. And I'm wondering, you're looking at so much and you have so much data, my understanding is there's quite a bit of radioactive isotopes and things which have a, quite a bit of energy that are being dispersed into the, the North Pacific. And my question is, are you seeing any signal from that into your models? And are your models taking into consideration this? Are you seeing things in your collections? I mean, I feel like I'm, there's a lot that's still going on in Japan, and I'm not hearing about it. Yeah, so the, the question had to do with uh, the, uh, you know, any kind of signals that we may have seen or we may be seeing um, uh, following the Fukushima um, accident. Um, and, and the answer is, um, actually, there was recently a, 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 a conference here uh, where, where we, we, we talked about um, how much, you know, how much are we seeing, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, any radiation or cesium levels and such. And, and the answer is that there are parts in, in Japan that, that, that perhaps are, are seeing some. Uh, but in the broader uh, North Pacific, it's, 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 um, it's not something that, that we're seeing in any, in any form or at any level that, that, would, that, that, that at this stage would cause any kind of uh, concern. Um, it is something that, that is being funded um, by the Japanese government, and we are working with them. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in various places, we certainly have seen the debris come over and, every, you know, we've all seen pictures in the newspaper uh, that some, some, at, some, some elements of, of debris do make it all the way to our coast. But we're not, we're not seeing any, any levels, um, except perhaps in some places very near Japan, um, that, that, uh, that perhaps would be one where you would, where you would perhaps be concerned. So it's something we're monitoring and we're watching, but nothing yet. I've kind of been waiting for the other climate change shoe to drop. Is it way too far a leap of uh, assumption to to think that all these models seem to point to me that the cooler the water, the more productive? And if if uh, the Earth is gradually warming or warming much more rapidly than has it has it has historically, is it safe to assume, or can we be afraid of assuming that? production of uh, entire fisheries uh, worldwide will start to drop off? The question um, is, uh, are the, the, perhaps the warming that, that we're observing going to affect the productivity of, of, of the oceans um, and, and uh, thereby the productivity of fisheries and so on? Um, so we, the, the, the effects of warming uh, can, be, can, be in, in, can be seen in a number of ways, or they can manifest themselves in a number of ways. You know, uh, you know one, you could, you could warm the water, uh, you could increase the stratification, so warm water over cold water. And that cold water, uh, is, 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 uh, which is normally deeper, is, is that water which is, has more nutrients in it. And, and when you bring that cold water up, then that nutrient, those nutrients fuel perhaps you know, the, the food webs that we were talking about. So stratification can perhaps suppress some of that cold water coming up, um, and and there are things that we're looking at in terms of uh, you know what those effects are. Uh, if if you don't bring those waters up and you aren't able to oxygenate them, I think you know one of the things that we're seeing is perhaps drops in oxygen as well, related to to the fact that the waters are staying deeper for longer and not coming up. Um, in some cases, the, the warm waters are, are you know, caused by a geographic shift, so that the fish will just move out of the, out of the region. And that was perhaps one of the things that you know, we're trying to still to unravel with the sardine and anchovy. Um, you know, when we see warm water um, here on our coast, or too warm, you know, depending on how you define too warm, you'll, you'll see the, the species just leaving and going north. Uh, we've, we've noticed that already with um, say, uh, sardine and anchovy going further north uh, than, than we have in the previous years, in part to, due to the warm blob. On the other hand, we've seen, we saw the presence of, of tuna uh, that, that we hadn't seen before, which is associated with warmer water. So the warming, uh, you know, could have a number of, of different effects from affecting the, the lower levels of the food web all the way to shifts in, in the organisms. 
in the distribution of the organisms, I'm sorry, as well as changing the, the vital rates of the organisms themselves. I'm going too long with the answer here. But uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, is, is warming is, is uh, temperature is a huge effect on, 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 on marine life. Uh, it has a whole spectrum of, of ways of manifesting itself, and, and in some cases it, it, it brings some positive increased growth. In other cases, it causes shifts. In other cases, it might cause uh, declines or absences. So it's, not a, it's a very good question, and, it's, and, it's, and it just has a, a, a very long answer, longer perhaps than I can get into here. But I'd love to talk about it more if you wish. We're about uh, 20 years into the recent Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And right now we're in the cool phase of it, at least for us. Is there any indication that we're switching over and flipping? I've heard rumors or whatever that we're flipping to the warm phase, in which case would you like to speculate on the disaster that's going to produce? Yeah. <laughs> So the question has to do what, what phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation we're in. And, and very quickly, a Pacific, a Pacific Decadal Oscillation, like, like the name says, it, 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 in the North Pacific, you, you, you can see, um, if you look at, 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 the, at, the, at the eastern side of the Pacific where we are and the western side of the Pacific off Asia, um, over time, or you can see on 10-year timescales, decadal timescales roughly, uh, the temperature anomaly is perhaps shifting. It'll, get, it'll be warm on one side of the ocean, cold on the other one, and then it'll shift and it'll be cold here and warm on, the other, on, on, on just the opposite. So it's a sort of a seesaw, if you will. Um, we have been, uh, you know, like I showed before, you know, if you looked at, 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 the, at the time when, um, you know, those, those uh, rockfish were recovering and it was a good environment is when the Pacific the, the, the Oscillation was cold off here, so it was a negative phase of the, of, the, of the PDO, as we call it. And that caused a lot of good things for salmon, it, caused, it was good for the rockfish, um, maybe not so good for the sardine. Um, and what the answer, the question is, are we possibly going into a negative, into a positive phase of the PDO, which means warmer off here? Um, it, 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 the thing with these decadal oscillations is that you don't know you're in them until you're in them, right? So it's hard to tell because you need, you need a few years to, to see whether the system is locked into to a particular phase of, of, in this case, the PDO. So because we had the warm blob, because we had the El Nino, um, it, 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 it at times did look like we were heading into a positive PDO, so warming off, off our coast. Um, it, it has been so unusual and so different because of this blob and because of, you know, the Nino that kind of appeared but not really. The, I'm not sure yet, um, we're not sure yet if we've locked into, a, in, into say, a, a positive phase or a warm phase for us, a warm phase for us of the PDO. If we did, then, then there are, if we look back in the record, again, the importance of looking back in time and see what happened. We would, we would see that, that some species um, are, are favored, some are not. I mean, so you would see the, the salmon not doing as well, uh, but perhaps you would see the sardine actually doing pretty well. So it depends, on, it depends on the organism. So it's not all bleak or all positive in terms of what, 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 what a particular manifestation of, of, of the PDO would do. So give me a couple of years and I'll tell you what the PDO is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.